It is Tecmo Tuesday, and even though this is not technically the bye week, uh, the Colts bye week was technically back in week four, I am following what is, I guess, now a Tecmo Tuesday tradition of doing a mid-season recap, so I skipped the bye week in week four, went straight to week five, and right here at the halfway point, eight games have been played, and we'll recap what has happened so far, and then we'll get back to the games next week. So without wasting any more time, let's take a look at what happened. The season kicked off with a matchup with the Browns. After holding Cleveland to a punt on the first possession, the Colts picked up some decent chunks of yardage on the ground, and then Jeff George finds receiver Jesse Hester, who makes a diving catch in the end zone to score the first points of the season, 7-0 indeed. The Colts hold them to another punt, and the rookie running back out of Notre Dame, Rodney Culver, shakes off a tackler and picks up 31 yards to the 15. That sets up George to the latest acquisition, Reggie Foghorn Langhorn, former Brown, and it's 14-0 Colts. The Browns punt again, and with 9 seconds left in the half on their own 43, George just launches it to Langhorn for the Hail Mary touchdown, 21-0 at the half. First possession of the second half on third down, George finds Anthony Johnson deep, and he scores for the 48-yard touchdown, 28-0 Colts. Browns get the ball, and Kevin Mack finally gets the Browns the big play that they needed with a 69-yard run along the sideline until finally being brought down on the 19th. That would set up a field goal by Matt Stover to get the Browns on the board 28-3. First play of the next drive, George throws to the new tight end, Kerry Cash, replacing Jim Beach, who went to the Eagles, and the intermediate route turns into a 57-yard touchdown, 35-3. Colts would put their backups in at this point, and backup running back Maurice Carthon scores on a garbage time touchdown to put the icing on the cake. 42-3 was the final. George completed 75% of his passes for 215 yards, and Falkhorn Langhorn stuck it to his ex-mates with two touchdown catches for 72 yards total. The story of the day was the Colts' defense, who stood tall throughout the day. Most of the yardage they gave up was on that one run by Mack. This is a far cry from last year when they got repeatedly gashed. Would this be a trend going forward? Well, if they want to be tested, who better than the dangerous run and shoot offense of the Houston Oilers? Webster Slaughter takes the opening kickoff for the Oilers, and he could go all the way to the 16 yard line. But the defense holds true, and Al Del Greco puts a field goal through, and Houston strikes first 3 0. George finds Kerry Cash, and like last week, he turns an intermediate route into a big gain to the 23. But then on third and two, Johnson fumbles the ball after crossing the first down marker, and the Oilers get the ball back. The defense does hold Houston to a punt, and then Hester gets a big reception to the Oilers' 32. Two plays later, George finds Langhorn wide open in the corner of the end zone, and the Colts get on the board 7-3. And that would be the score at halftime. Third quarter now. George finds Langhorn, who takes the ball into the red zone, and then Culver takes the ball down to the two, which sets up a touchdown for Anthony Johnson, 14-3 Colts. Oilers finally get something together with Moon throwing deep to Curtis Duncan, who makes a leaping catch and takes it to the 15, and that sets up Moon to Duncan again for the touchdown, and just like that, it's 14-10. Next drive, fourth quarter, the Colts matriculate the ball down the field and face a fourth and one situation. They pitch it to Culver, he runs into a brick wall and gets stuffed just before the marker. The Oilers get the ball back with 3.43 left to play. On third and one, they run the draw to Low White in the Seven Dwarfs, and the Goose, Siragusa, stuffs him for a two-yard loss, forcing them to punt. The Colts matriculate the ball down the field, eat up some clock, and with 13 seconds left, Dean Biasushi puts the field goal through to extend the lead 17-10. And with only enough time for a kickoff return, the Oilers fail to take it the distance, and the Colts get the win. It was a defensive struggle, which is a testament to the improved D of the Colts. It's always impressive to keep the Oilers' high-powered offense in check. From one AFC powerhouse to another, the Colts' arch-rival the Bills are up next in what could be a pivotal early game in getting the inside track in the AFC East. The Bills go three and out to start the game, and from the shadow of their own goalpost, George tosses to Cash to pick up the first down, and then finds him again over the middle to the 28-yard line. 
and the rookie Culver fumbles, but the ball sails out of bounds. Very next play, George finds Langhorn in the end zone for the touchdown, 7-0 Colts. The Bills play fake to Thurman Thomas, who Kelly ends up throwing to deep to set the Bills up in the red zone. After a sack forces a third and 15, Jim Kelly finds future Hall of Famer James Lofton in tight coverage for the touchdown to tie the game at 7. Next possession for the Colts, Culver takes the short pass, but fumbles it again. This time it doesn't go out of bounds, and the Bills recover. Jim Kelly scrambles and runs to the 31, which sets up Thurman, who takes it all the way, and it's 14-7 Bills at the half. Third quarter now, Colts driving, and Anthony Johnson's the one who fumbles this time, but this one also gets out of bounds. Next play, George throws to Hester, who makes the leaping catch in the end zone, and it's 14-14. Now, strangely, both scores for the Colts were preceded by fumbles that fell out of bounds. Next possession for the Bills, Andre Reed makes a diving catch into Colts' territory on third down. That leads to a field goal attempt by Steve Christie, which goes off the upright, and the game is still tied. Colts go deep right away to Jesse Hester, who takes it to the 15, but the ball bounces in and out of the hands of Cash on third down, and the Colts have to settle for a field goal to go up 17-14 with 2.45 to go. With a minute and a half left, Kelly goes deep to tight end Pete Metzelars, who makes the diving catch and takes it to the 11. But the Bills can't quite put it into the end zone, and they kick the field goal to put the game into overtime. Bills win the toss, and the first play, Thurman takes the pitch and takes it all the way into Colt territory. That sets up Kelly throwing deep for Reed in the end zone, and he makes the catch in double coverage. Unbelievable way to close out the game. This time, the Colts' D couldn't make the big plays. Thurman had some big gains on the ground, and of course, the big plays through the air, including the game winner by Reed. The big difference, though, was the running game. Colts could only get 36 yards on the ground, so they were pretty one-dimensional, whereas the Bills had a more complete effort. Combine that with the one turnover, and it leads to a Bills victory. So after a bye, the Colts come in to take on the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Bucks go three and out, and George starts off going to Hester for a big gain into Tampa territory. They matriculate the rest of the way, capping it off with a 15-yard strike to carry cash, 7-0 Indy. Next possession, Vinny Testaverde throws to Mark Carrier, who gets a lot of yards after the catch to the 28. Next play, Vinny throws deep to Reggie Cobb, just out of reach of the defender for the touchdown, and the game is tied at 7. Next possession, after a sack forces a third and 23, George launches to who else? Reggie Langhorn, who hauls it in for the touchdown, 14-7 Colts. The Bucks pitch it to Cobb, who had the last touchdown, and he breaks some tackles and plows through for a huge gain. The Bucks run out of time, though, and have to settle for a field goal by Ken Willis, which goes off the upright and in, 14-10 at halftime. Clarence Verdon gets a nice return to start the second half into Tampa territory, and in the next play, Culver gets a nice run for a first down, but ends up getting injured, summoning Ken Clark off the bench. That would set up George DeLanghorn for the touchdown. The cornerback just let him by, and it's 21-10 Colts. Tampa starts driving, and Vinny tosses it deep to Lawrence Dossie for the touchdown, 21-17 late in the third. Colts matriculate the ball down the field, and Jesse Hester gets a big gain on the reception, but ends up getting hurt. So two starters are down for the Colts in this game. Anthony Johnson plows through, though, and scores to give Indy some breathing room, 28-17. Cobb takes the pitch and once again breaks through the defenders, and this time he takes it to the house, 28-24 Indy with two and a half to go. Bucks fail to recover the onside kick, and the Colts work the clock for a bit until finding Kerry Cash in the end zone to make it 35-24, and that would be the final score. Jeff George completed every single pass of the game for 208 yards. One possible area of concern, though, was the explosive plays on the ground for the Bucks. Giving up the big play was the Achilles heel of the Colts last year. After a strong start for the D this season, it seems like these big plays are starting to happen again, so better keep an eye out for that. J-E-T-S, Jets, 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 our N-E-X-T, next, next, next on the docket. Jets get the ball first, and Brad Baxter was the star of the show on the first drive, particularly on this 55-yard run down to the 27. And then he caps it off on a pitch after the entire defense buys into the play fake for a 17-yard run, and the Jets strike first. First possession for the Colts on third and 15. 
George throws it across the field, and it gives Brian Washington enough time to come back and get the interception. Take a look at this play by the safety. He's playing up front, and then reads George's eyes and cuts back just in time to make the pick. Great play. That would lead to Brian Nagel to Chris Burkett in tight coverage, and that would set up Blair Thomas, who barrels his way for the three-yard score, 14-0 Jets. Less than a minute and a half left in the first half, George throws deep to Bill Brooks, who makes the diving catch to the 10. The very next play, Ken Clark runs it for the touchdown to get the Colts on the board, and it's 14-7 Jets at the half. Nice kickoff return from Clarence Verdon gives the Colts good starting field position, and the Colts almost cough it up when a fumble by Anthony Johnson gets picked back up by the offense, but it forces Johnson to the bench. On third and 15, Maurice Carthon, who replaced Johnson, lets the ball slip through his fingertips, and it forces the Colts to try a 60-yard field goal, which goes doink off the upright, and it's still 14-7. Colts defense do stiffen up and force a punt, though. Maurice Carthon, who has Butterfingers today, fumbles, and somehow the Colts keep it again. Very next play on third and 10, George launches it to Falkhorn Langhorn, and he makes the leaping catch to get the Colts into the red zone. That would set up George to Langhorn again in the corner of the end zone, and the game is tied at 14. Three minutes to go on third and one, the Colts D blows up the backfield and forces the Jets to punt. George throws it deep to Brooks along the sideline and gets brought down on the six. Ken Clark takes the pitch, shrugs off the defender, and takes it into the end zone to give the Colts their first lead of the day at 21-14, and that would be the final. After the Jets scored on their first two possessions, they were held scoreless the rest of the way, and the Colts scored the remaining 21 points. After a rough start, Indy's defense came back from the dead and kept the Jets from doing much of anything in the second half. Nagel, in particular, only completed one pass, and Baxter, who was the one bright spot for the Jets' offense early on, didn't get much the rest of the way. Next up is the Chargers, who will be on the schedule in two more weeks for an out-of-division rematch. The big guy, Marion Butts, takes it up the middle for a huge gain down to the 29. That would set up Stan Humphreys on third down to Nate Lewis in the end zone, just out of the reach of the defender, and it's 7-0 San Diego. Colts get the ball, and they decide to go deep on third down as well, with Jesse Hester making the diving catch for the touchdown, tying the game at 7. Last play of the first quarter, Humphreys goes deep to Anthony Miller, who's blanketed with the coverage, but he makes the catch anyway, which sets up Marion Butts with another touchdown run to give the Chargers a 14-7 lead. George, feeling the hot hand, says, why not go deep again? This time to my running back, and Anthony Johnson takes it into the red zone. And that would set up George to cash on the short pass for the touchdown, and we're all tied up again. First drive of the second half, Rodney Culver fumbles, and the Chargers pick it up. That would set up Marion Butts, who fakes the reverse and just goes through the D like a hot knife through butter. It's 21-14 San Diego. George finds Johnson again in stride and once again gets the Colts to the 20. That would set up George to his favorite target this year, Langhorn, in the end zone, and it's 21 all with a minute to go in the third. This time the Colts defense holds up and gets Indy the ball back. George throws to Langhorn, who gets the team in great field position, but the offense stalls and Biasushi puts a field goal through to go up 24-21. Humphreys takes the flea flicker and throws into coverage, and this time the D comes away with the pick. Colts matriculate the ball down the field, but they end up settling for a field goal to make it 27-21. But since just about all the time was eaten up by that drive, that would end up being the final score. Chargers offense had a decent day. Marion Butts in particular was the star of the show for them. Their passing attack was fairly ordinary but it could be a troubling trend for the Colts to see that their run defense getting gashed again. And you had to know that the pass defense was going to be the area of focus in the next matchup with the Miami Dolphins. And Dan the Man Marino was looking to test them early with intermediate passes to Mark Clayton on the opening drive to get the Dolphins in good field position. But the drive would stall, and the Dolphins would settle for a field goal, 3-0 Miami. First possession for the Colts. George launches it to Hester, who dives for it, setting up the Colts on the 12. Brian Cox would get a sack on third down and force the Colts to tie the game up with the field goal. Under two minutes to go in the half, and Marino dumps it off to Bobby Humphrey, who picks up a huge gain after the catch. But then Marino, who's not much of a runner, decides to scramble and coughs up the ball, and the score would remain tied at three at halftime. 
Colts get the ball to start the second half, and George goes deep to carry Cash, who makes a terrific catch in tight coverage. And that would set up another pass to Cash, who takes it in for the first touchdown of the game, and it's 10-3 Colts. The next drive stalls out for the Dolphins, but they go for a 65-yard field goal, which misses wide. But on the next play, Culver fumbles it right back, and the Dolphins get the ball basically where they were. Bobby Humphrey makes a catch in tight coverage himself, which leads to Mark Higgs running it in for the score to tie the game back at 10. Colts get the ball to midfield, and on third and one, the Dolphins blow up the line and force a five-yard loss, forcing a punt with two and a half minutes to go in the game. On third and 18, the pass falls incomplete, but the Dolphins foolishly go for it on fourth and 18 in a tie game with a minute left. This is worse than Barry Switzer's fourth down call. This leads to a sack, which sets the Colts up on the doorstep of the end zone, and Johnson runs it in for the game winner, 17-10 Colts. The only talking point after this game was the decision to go for it. It actually overshadows the 65-yard field goal attempt from earlier. It was a defensive struggle otherwise for the most part, all the more reason not to go for it in that situation. The loss knocks the Dolphins down to 2-5, and five, and the Colts at 6-1 and one are one game back of the undefeated Bills. Final game of the first half of the season is a rematch from two weeks ago between the Bolts and the Colts. Chargers get the ball and put together a good drive, and by good I mean Chris Good, who caps it off by picking off Stan Humphreys, so it was not good for San Diego. Jeff George tosses it to Kerry Cash, who makes everyone on the defense miss and takes it to the house, 7-0. Next possession for San Diego, Marion Butts gets a huge gain along the sideline into Indy territory. That sets up Humphreys deep to Anthony Miller, and it's just out of reach of the defender for the touchdown, and the game is tied at 7. Colts matriculate the ball down the field to close out the half, and finish it off with a touchdown to Langhorn in the corner. Seems to be his favorite spot, and it's 14-7 at halftime. Colts get the ball to start the second half, but are forced to punt and Eric sleeping with the enemy gets a huge return to give the Chargers great field position. But Marion Butts loses the ball on his way into the end zone, and another red zone turnover haunts the Chargers. George then connects with Hester to get into Charger territory, then to cash for another first down, but the drive stalls from there, and the Colts end up kicking a field goal. But it gives them a two-score lead with less than four minutes left. Marion Butts tries to totally redeem himself with a big gain to midfield, he does fumble, but it rolls out of bounds. That would set up a flea flicker, and Humphreys connects to Nate Lewis for the touchdown, 17-14. Chargers go for the onside kick, and almost recover it. But this isn't horseshoes, and it isn't hand grenades, and the Colts hang on to win 17-14. Stats were pretty even. Colts did a little bit better through the air, and Chargers did a little bit better on the ground. No surprise there with that dynamic. But the big difference of the game was those two turnovers in the red zone by the Chargers. They absolutely killed San Diego and left points on the board. So after eight games, the Colts are 7-1 and one, and still one game behind the Bills. That one overtime win for the Bills over the Colts being the difference. But there's a lot of football left to be played. And we'll see how that plays out next week in the rematch with the Miami Dolphins. See you then.